I remember turning 11 years old in 2009. Wow, I'm old. And having my birthday party with a couple of friends and we're all having fun and doing whatever the hell 11 year olds do. But there was one gift that I remember getting out of all the other gifts and it was this game called Gears of War 2. Not only was this an interesting gift to get an 11 year old, I also hadn't played the first one yet. So I had no idea what to expect while looking at the cover. I had no idea that this game would be the reason that this franchise was and remains as one of my favorite series to this very day. It was also one of the first few games that I played online along with Halo Reach and other games. Fighting through 50 ways of horror just with Mauler shields set up on river chainsaw dueling friends on blood drive and just burning through the campaign with friends and family after my video i did on the first game which you should go check out by the way if you haven't already i figured why not go relive those old memories and make a video on this game as well Gears of War 2 has been regarded as one of, if not the best, in the entire franchise, and it's my favorite in the series. The combat feels smooth, the story and the pacing is great, the graphics, the gore, the weapons, the music, the characters, they've got more dialogue than the first game, they feel like actual characters this time around with great voice acting, for the most part. There's more enemy types, there are more weapons, there's more executions, I'm pretty sure you got the picture by now. Gears of War 2 is just an amazing game. This doesn't mean that the first one was bad in comparison, I think that the first one still holds up to this day, and that dark, gritty atmosphere of that game was amazing but it was left out within the second game there's already dark themes in this story and it works just fine this game probably has some of the most memorable moments in the entire series the attack of scourge in the beginning the giant worm dom's story the queen finally being revealed as long as the ultimate edition wasn't your first game and a finale we're finally seeing these characters have some more emotion than just being gruff get it done soldiers we may not have knowledge or even see some of them but everyone has a presence here the first game was really central on the main four and their objective there was some world building but this game goes much beyond that. There's collectibles throughout this game just outside of the dog tags that actually have extra information or exposition on something relative to where you found it. And they aren't always necessary to understand what they're actually telling you, but it does really help put the pieces together and actually give some more context to some of the things you might be walking through. I love these underlying themes and deeper questions that I didn't really understand when I was first playing a game with, you know, me being a child. Things like the relations between the cog and the civilians slash stranded to things like making the decision to destroy their own turf by flooding everything just to ensure their survival. Much like the hammer strikes at the beginning of the Locust War, the moral ethics or lack thereof of whatever the fuck is happening in a New Hope facility and so on. Aside from the campaign, the addition of the new horde mode and an updated multiplayer definitely added to this game's success. The campaign is great on its own, but the multiplayer side of it, especially with the rise of online gaming around this time, did really well for it. Horde mode was such an amazing addition to this series as it got popularity extremely quickly. It's been added in every single Gears game since this one with improvements and major changes to each following game. But for this first horde mode, it's just you, your buddies and whatever map you chose for 50 waves of enemies. Like most people, me and my friends are trapping ourselves in a house on River, which is Mauler Shields planted outside. There really wasn't much to it, but that didn't stop people from having fun with it. I'm not going to really critique the multiplayer modes or the horde mode. I'm just really going to critique the story, but it's important to mention those modes to understand the success of this game as a whole. Although I might do a video just revisiting those modes with some friends anyways. So if you want to play those, let me know. Before we get on to the story, let's talk about the additions and changes that they've made. There are many changes that just tremendously improves the overall quality of the game. Gunshots in this game all sound very different. They sound more realistic and impactful. And now there's chainsaw duels, so when you and the opposing person have revved up both of your chainsaws, you enter a clash and you'll have to mash the B button in order to win. This is used a lot towards the end of the game and against one of the bosses of the game, and it always feels so cool. I can't tell you how many chainsaw duels on Blood Drive I've had with friends. We'd all just walk around chainsawing each other. It was so stupid, but pretty fun. The hammer burst got reworked, and it's a completely different gun now. Instead of being a burst weapon, it's now a semi-automatic weapon and shoots as fast as you can pull the trigger and can take headshots. I never much liked the hammer burst in the first game. It sounded weird, it didn't really do too much damage, and it was just a burst weapon, so it already lost me there. But this hammer burst actually feels pretty good to use. There's actually a new burst weapon called the Gorgon Pistol. It shoots a burst of four, but can also hold a lot of ammo for the weapon. Despite what I said about burst weapons, this one actually isn't too bad. I actually ended up using this one for a while just because of the ammo capacity alone. There's also a new grenade type called ink grenades that do just that, ink. If you step in the area of it, then as anyone would have guessed, you take damage over time as in it's poisonous. There's also a couple more new weapons than just those. There's the mortar, the grinder, or mulcher, I guess, the flamethrower, and even a cleaver. The boltot got a slight change, which now when you act or reload, it'll shoot much faster if you press the trigger faster. The gameplay is about the same as always. It's still the Gears third-person cover-based shooter. They did add a couple more executions, and you can also now take a downed enemy as a meat shield. You'll pick them up and use them as cover until you either press X to break their neck, or they get riddled with bullets 
bullets and you'll have to drop them. They didn't get to use it too much in a campaign, but man is really useful in multiplayer. All the overall mechanics are kept the same. Each act has you doing something that isn't just walking forward, getting cover and shoot. You're riding these rigs, using rockworms as cover, dodging hail, driving in the mountains, using a boat, and then this. There's a lot that happens in this game that keeps it from being stale and definitely adds to its replayability. Lastly, instead of just three difficulties, there's actually four. Last time it was casual, hardcore, and insane. Now it's casual, normal, hardcore, and insane. Before I get to the story, do know that this is a critique, so I'm going to be as nitpicky as possible with each part of this game. Some smaller issues, some slightly bigger ones. Of course, all the things I may say don't detract from the fact that this was one of the best games of the 360 generation, but we all know this game had its issues. You start out at a hospital. Anya, Marcus, and Dom see a bunch of gears coming in with wounded around them, and they're wondering what made them come like this in the first place. They had just been attacked by some locusts nearby, and Anya says that the locusts appear to be moving deeper each day. Anya then leaves to go check up on a lead seemingly related to Dom. Then a gear shows up with his bag saying he's a new trainee for Delta and they give you a choice to either train with the Rook or get straight to the action again, just like the first game. As opposed to the first game, now there's a bigger difference if you choose to go train this Rook rather than actually just going straight to the action. The gameplay is different and you actually get some extra dialogue here too. You come to find out that this is actually Carmine. Yeah, Benjamin Carmine, the next brother after Anthony and who could forget Anthony? He's just like his older brother as well, extremely fascinated with Marcus and the fact that he's a war hero not knowing how to reload, everything like that. You teach him the ropes, which the game also teaches you at the same time. I also love this section and any interaction with Ben in this game, and I love how disrespectful Dom is anytime Anthony is brought up. I served with Anthony. He was a good soldier. My respects. Thanks. Just good to know he died a hero's death. Uh, yeah. Right. Hey, Marcus, check this shot. See? You go through the tutorial, then head back to the hospital, leaving Carmine to a position to defend himself, while Marcus and Dom go help the soldiers on the inside. Anya is still inside the hospital and tells Dom that she has a lead in searching for his wife, and that it's a possible Jane Doe, but she'll have to look into it further. This implies that his wife was taken hostage, and this clearly upsets him. Next enters a man by the name of Ty, who suffers a very tragic fate, but we will get there later. When moving through the hospital together, they wonder what's making the locusts act so desperately in their attacks on the cities, and Marcus thinks that they're getting desperate, or that maybe there's something else happening down there where the locusts live. Literally right after him saying that, you come up to a ward with people sick from rust lung, which is a sickness due to prolonged emulsion exposure. This started happening more and more apparently after the light mess bomb in the first game. This is very subtle as emulsion is the very reason why the locusts are getting desperate in the first place, although we don't know that yet. You and Delta clear out the hospital in multiple sections. Ty likes the blood of his enemies. Carmine can't reload. Shocker. You clear the streets and then Anya calls. She tells Don that the Jane Doe that she mentioned got released a few days ago and that there aren't any more leads on her. And I've got some things to say on Don and a pursuit of his wife, but we'll get to it later. After this, while on their way to land down to drill down into the hollow, Chairman Prescott, someone we didn't see last game, but he's essentially the president, is giving probably the most inspiring speech to all the gears, and even the stranded are listening on radios. The whole scene still gives me chills while watching it. It's a very nostalgic, heroic, and inspiring speech. The music and all the gears rallying behind his words is what makes this all the more heroic and inspiring. Shit, the locust in their world is extremely terrifying, and I probably wouldn't survive very far, but this speech makes me want to go fight for humanity too. Delta meets Dizzy as he's their driver on these assault derricks. Marcus explained on a helicopter ride that the plan is to use the derrick to get to land down, a town a bit away from Jacinto, drill underground, and attack them there before they have the chance to sink any more cities, including Jacinto, which is their last holding city. They start making their way there, and they start getting attacked almost instantly. You gotta defend against Nemesis mortars, there's Reavers coming at you, the rig eventually crashes, and you have to defend against an ambush. Then eventually, after Dizzy fixes the rig, a horde of locusts start coming out of the ground and start grappling up on y'all's rigs, attacking and hijacking one across from you and eventually trying to do the same to your rig. You defend against those locusts attacking you, you destroy the other hijacked rig, you cross a bridge, you defend against some more hijackers, you kill a broomock, and then you're on your way to land down. It really adds to the fact that this is war. Even if you're not engaging all that much, all these enemies that you don't really need to encounter on the ground, all these other gears are actually encountering them and still dying as well. It very much adds to the intensity of the situation everybody's in right now. As well as the music, which if you haven't figured it out by now, quick disclaimer, I'm going to be talking about the music a lot in this video. But that's because Gears of War 2 probably has the best soundtrack in all of the Gears series. So you can thank Steve Jablonski for that. Or did I pronounce that name correctly? I hope so. They finally arrive to the locust infested land down and the rig right behind you is attacked by these bug looking things known as tickers and it blows the fuck up. Yet from the rubble, without a single scratch or ache at 
at all rises Ty. These dudes don't even go check the crash to see if anybody actually survived. They just assume that they're all dead except for Ty. It's a little fucked up, but they start moving through the town and escort Dizzy's rig on foot so that these tickers don't destroy his as well. You start moving through the town. I think this place is a strip club or used to be one because why are there two poles here and then a bar off over here? Obviously, I never caught this when I was younger, but this is pretty funny. Let me know if you guys are trying to come down to the land down strip club. Sorry, moving on. We talk about how it's surprising that the Cog hasn't tried taking back this town from the Locust since it got overran so long ago, with it being so close to Jacinto. And Marcus says the Cog probably had their reasons, just not any good ones. We never get to fully know these reasons, but it's been understood that the Cog probably isn't the best government, so it's safe to say that Marcus is probably right. You fight through some ambushes, a tunnel littered with tickers, another ambush, then kill a Brumach. And it's here you get that new weapon, the mortar, like I talked about. You reach the drilling site and you need to clear the area so you can begin drilling once Dizzy's ready. Once they start getting ready to drill down a crazy elite locust with dreadlocks and a spear that has chainsaws on each side of it cuts to a fucking tank and starts attacking everybody. Marcus and Dom rush to get everybody locked inside the pod and Ty and Dizzy are left trying to defend against the locust with locks. They try getting back out to help but they can't as it's locked and are sent underground unable to help. They lose contact with the surface and they have no idea what happened to Dizzy. Also going down like this must fucking suck. You know like those amusement park rides where you go up and then you go back down like a terror tower or something like that? Except this you just go down and then you crash at the bottom there's no safe landing like at an amusement park carmine's also down here but in a different location so dom and marcus split up to search for him you can see some of the cog land down and start joining the fight as well i never noticed until i played this time that jay stratton from gears 3 and rom shadow was the gear that marcus was talking to here by the time we make it to carmine however his other jump mate is dead and he's holding out by himself you help him clear out the area then you use the fallen grind lift to get through the wall next to you guys since that's the direction you need to go in dom complains about the dust in his face and carmine says he can just wear a helmet because it has a filter for air. But then Dom. Right? If you wore a helmet, then you wouldn't have to breathe in the dust. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't see snipers so well then, would I? Cool it, Dom. Ben doesn't even know what Don was referring to when he said that. Like, that's so fucked up. Later, you get back in contact with Control, and she says that there's been a lot of seismic activity near Lima City and to investigate it when they can. So that's our next objective. She also mentions to Dom that a lot of stranded camps have been getting hit and that they've been fleeing underground and Maria may be with them as well. What comes up next is a weird looking worm with a rock-like exterior, a rock worm, if you will. It's native to these caves and feeds on these glowing plants that you've been seeing a couple times before actually getting here. They're also indestructible. The rockworms here are setting up two things for this game. One as an additional part of combat because you're going to be using the glowing fruit to lure it over. Use the worm as cover from locust gunfire, which for some reason feels really fucked up. Like I know they're indestructible, but does it bother the guy? At least they get some free food out of it. I also just discovered that when the worm's crawling to the next fruit, if you shoot its tail, it'll actually start moving faster. Just something I never noticed before. Maybe they do feel the pain. The other thing they're setting up, you could probably figure out on your own before it happens. They also have stank breath, so watch out for that. Quick note here, I've probably played this game dozens of times over in a campaign, and yet this is still my first time noticing that this is the worm right here on the left side. You can actually see the worm move a little bit right here when they say that they have seismic activity, but they didn't even look up. Neither did I, I guess. You then get to a ridge and see some grind lifts coming down, and you save them from some mortar fire. After helping them out, you see what's been causing all this seismic activity, and probably what's sinking the cities. The characters see it and say they don't know what it is, but I mean, it's pretty damn obvious considering what we've seen. But I guess they're all gonna act dense about it for now since the reveal is not here yet. You get up to a place that has a lot of markings and different structures and you see a new enemy. This guy starts yelling and chanting at the beginning of the fight. These guys are called Cantus, the ones I mentioned earlier. They've seemingly been down here for a long time but just never really showed up. When the Cantus yells, not only do they raise any locust that was on the ground back up, but they will also summon tickers to come and attack you. But you fight through many more waves of locusts now with the Cantus joining the fight and then finally find out how the cities have been getting sunk the entire time. Scourge, the locust with locks from earlier that attacked everybody at land down is controlling the worm somehow through chance and sinking all the cities. And if you notice, Scourge is also here riding that same mount from the end of the first game as well. And honestly, while I've always known the plot of this game, when you say it out loud like that, it sounds extremely ludicrous. Like if I go up to someone and explain this game's plot to them and they know nothing about Gears or shit, even if they do, saying it out loud sounds pretty dumb, but it's happening and it's truly demolishing these cities. And then here we get the greatest line in all of the Gears games. Anya, it's a giant worm. They're sinking cities with a giant worm. 
So the entire city of Lima was just destroyed in front of us. And now we get to go through the sunken city. And I gotta be honest with you guys, if this shit happened in our world, I think I'm quitting. Because if Marcus and company didn't get the opportunity that they did to later stop the worm, how else would they have gone about stopping this? These worms are said to be indestructible and it definitely looks like a nuke or even hammer strikes would even stop it. It's kind of insane to me that these guys have the will to even keep going. They also deduced that the Locust's plan must be to sink all cities around Jacinto just to sink Jacinto itself. Thankfully, most of the city was already evacuated to begin with, but there is a chopper that just went down in the city, so they decide to go help them out. And now's the time for another new enemy, the Blood Mounts. These really, really weird looking things are honestly the bane of my playthrough experience. I hate these enemies, especially in the later chapters of the game when there's much more you have to fight. So they're these beasts that have a rider on top of it, promptly named Beast Riders. You can either shoot the beast first and the rider will still be alive, but they'll fall and you just have to kill them next before they stand up or when they stand up. Or you can shoot the rider off first and still have to deal with the beast that chases you and you'll have to kill them too. What's difficult about them isn't just the fact that it's two enemies in one, it's also that they move extremely fast, making them hard to shoot. And they slap the fuck out of you on higher difficulties. Then to top it off, the rider's also shooting at you as well. You fight through the city, fight some reavers, and then you get to the crash site. But Cole was just trying to warn Delta a second ago of something before they arrived, likely an ambush. But Delta moves forward anyway after hearing that without even thinking about it. You get there, everybody that was in the crash site is dead, and boom, ambush. What a surprise. You hold them off or hide like I did because I was hungry and made some food and eventually Cole comes through and fucks these dudes up like he's out here playing thrash ball. Sticking the dude on the back like this I always thought was cool as shit. They meet up and then decide to go search for Baird and a guy named Tanner. Right after you fight through some groups of enemies and hold on time out really fast how do you guys all fight the Reavers here when they land on the ground? Because I've always just ran up under them and shot them like this because it's such an easy exploit. I do feel bad every time because I'm not really fighting the Reaver and they never get a chance to shoot at me but it's just much easier. Let me know if you do this too or if it I'm just weird and I just like cheating the game. But anyways, like I was saying, you fight through some locusts, you find Tanner, needless to say, but Tanner obviously did not make it. And then you find Baird like immediately. I'm glad he was just right here instead of where Ty ended up, which they see these barges that Baird says the locusts have been taking people on and doing messed up shit to them like torture and things like that. And that they should go see if they have any people captive now and try to get them out of there. You get rid of the locusts that just got off the barge next to you and you take that barge and now there's another new enemy variant called the Grinder. Not named after the app, but after the minigun that they use. Some of these grinders also have little cool hats. I don't know, I just like their hats. I wish I had one. But yeah, these guys are just like boomers and a couple more variants that we'll get introduced to later, but they just have a minigun and a cool hat. I always love the way they say GRIVE and just laugh at you maniacally while attempting to kill you. <laughs> But you check this barge out and it has no prisoners, crash into another barge, check that barge for prisoners, and it's here an ominous scene plays as the door opens and Ty is shown in one of the doors. I want to put a trigger warning here for self bye bye just in case you're watching this video without playing the game first. Don't know why you wouldn't play the game first, but whatever. You can hear him breathing super heavily and it's pretty creepy as he's just standing still. He comes out and has a shitload of lashes all over him and his eyes just look white and soulless. Marcus hands him a shotgun without thinking and... Oh, Bear, cover that door! Carmine, Dom, guard the rear! Time! No! And okay, so normally I don't care for characters too early, especially if they die kind of fast. And like I said before, we rarely saw much of Ty, but damn, did it hurt that he just Ernest Hemingwayed himself out of here. Cause he was the guy that these dudes looked at as someone who could get through anything, no matter what happens. And you see all these lashes on him and you got to think like, oh, he must've ate those. But then he does that and it's like, wow, what the fuck? What could they have been doing to him? It supposedly wasn't until recently that the locusts started taking hostages and torturing them. It also stressed me out that we didn't see Dizzy and isn't seen for the rest of the game. So you never actually know what happens to him. So it had me wondering if Dizzy ended up like this too, because I already grew to like Dizzy. I like that they left out whatever torture that they did to Ty and another important character later on in the story, since it leaves the player as perplexed as the ones they're playing as, as about what could have even happened to these people, that this is the result. You later talk to Control about what happened, and she says that you have a new objective and that there's a new raven coming to pick you up. So they go try and find the LZ high up on a building so that a raven can actually get to them, and shortly after they're there for a time, they hear some loud rumbling and see that the giant 
worm is on its way. The raven gets down to pick you guys up and everyone gets on board, but this dummy Carmine gets cocky and ends up getting shot. So he doesn't sit down, he just lays down. And because of that, using a little more time than they can afford and laying down like this, not only does something hit the raven so it starts losing control, he slips right out and into the worm. And right after the worm devours a whole raven with all of you in it. Fade to black and now it's in first person. A woman's voice keeps saying, Dom, as you're waking up. She, Maria, wakes you up, but Dom then really wakes up. They're really inside the worm now, and Marcus's plan is to stop the worm from sinking any more cities by killing it from the inside. Makes sense, I guess, even though the anatomy of this thing is entirely unknown and weird, but I guess we'll ignore that for now. So you move through and come up to the first of many obstacles, which is the teeth. Just huge and slimy with saliva, at least, I think. Baird asks a very real question, saying that the heart could be a mile down, and how would they know when and where to actually find it? And Marcus just tells him to shut up. And see, Baird is me and you guys asking for some kind of reasoning here, and Marcus is just a dev. It's like, yeah, man, don't worry about it. Just keep moving forward, okay? So I'm gonna take what he said and ignore any questions that I have that question logic because it doesn't matter, right? So there's only one enemy type here and it's these little things. I really don't know what to call them, but you get further and these monsters are fucking Carmine up. He shouldn't be talking right now because I'm pretty sure his lungs have either been eaten or disintegrated, but he gives his goodbyes to his family and his squad and then he dies. And there goes a the second Carmine. While this death is obviously sadder than Anthony's, it's also pretty stupid. Remember, if he hadn't have been out there like an idiot, he wouldn't have got shot. Sure, Anthony couldn't reload, but he got shot for situational awareness or lack thereof. But Ben, this dude just wasted time, got shot, and got eaten. But you know what's stupider? The fact that he got this far in the worm in the first place. Because if I remember correctly, from the place we crashed at, we were ahead of these digestive teeth, which always seemed to be moving, even if they weren't moving when the worm was swallowing. There still weren't any gaps that Carmine could have just slipped through to make his way past the teeth. And I don't think he just walked here himself because he got shot and fell like however many feet this was. So like, how? I guess we and these guys will never find out because now we gotta run. Never mind, sorry. Another thing, how did these four guys not hear Carmine screaming and yelling before they got over here? He was clearly in the middle of getting eaten before they even walked over here and yelling beforehand. So did they not hear him? Or was he just not yelling to begin with? Or did he just wait until the four guys showed up to then start screaming and yelling about getting eaten alive? Once again, doesn't matter. So yeah, this worm is trying to digest this huge ball of debris, which did it not go through the digestive teeth? He swallowed a lot, even for a worm this big. I know he's got indigestion. Acid reflux must be beating this worm's ass. But you run from the debris, and I'm not even going to begin to question the logic of the wall of the debris. Just phasing through some of these clearly stable parts of this worm's body, like these platforms, for example, or all these up here. I think these, it really doesn't matter, but I need some answers, man. Never questioned shit like this before, but I feel like since I'm already here, I have to at least see if anyone has ever wondered about this before. Anyway, you keep running from it, shoot some monsters, shoot some anal cavities that I really won't comment on, and escape out of it. I guess it just stops there, whatever. Now there's a bunch of acid nozzles spraying everywhere that are clearly toxic and will kill you fast, so you need to shoot them to pass for a second, and then you arrive at the intestines. It's a bunch of toxic gas in here that will suffocate you if you don't get out in time, and it's a bit of a maze, but it's not too difficult to get through. I can't imagine how awful this shit smells in here. You escape and eventually start actually hearing a heartbeat. You find a part of the worm and cut a couple arteries, but that doesn't seem to kill it. It just makes the heartbeat faster. You move forward, cut some more arteries. That's not enough either. I was gonna do a trigger warning for blood, like with the self-elimination of Ty, but this is Gears of War. And if you're watching this far, you know what you're getting into. But you get to the next and final heart, you cut down the four arteries, and then the worm finally dies. It comes out of the surface, spewing blood and shit everywhere like a drama queen. It falls down and Delta cuts their way out of there. Probably one of the nastiest scenes. They get out with a shit ton of blood flowing everywhere. I'm sure there's a joke here somewhere, but I can't really think of it right now. A raven arrives and drops off a tank instead of picking you guys up like Marcus actually requested, and Hoffman appears instead of Anya with new orders for them. They still don't have enough information on the Locust stronghold or the whereabouts of their leader, so their mission is to go to a recently declassified and decommissioned COG outpost that may have that information. Hoppin reveals to them that there is in fact the Locust Queen and that he essentially didn't know about any of this either, as it is Chairman Prescott that just declassified all this information. They obviously think this is really sketchy, but orders are orders and they don't really have any other options. Kind of sucks they get no recognition for whatever the fuck they just pulled, because like I said, if they hadn't gotten eaten, how else were they going to get rid of this worm? They they get to the facility and it's as ominous as you could have guessed. Delta 1, all right, if you haven't seen my first video, Delta 1 is Marcus and Dom and Delta 2 is, well, you get the point. But they explore the place to find an entrance as Delta 2 stays to watch the vehicle. Dom here starts asking the important questions like why is this place all the way out here and why did they decide to declassify it now? These sort of get halfway answered. Also, Hoffman is on comms for the time that you're here instead of Anya. She's back on comms once you leave this place, which must mean she isn't classified to know any of the shit that's going on here. You get in and get to a giant door at the end of the 
the hall and shit already starts getting weird and eerie. A guy on a screen or a few screens welcomes you to the Jameson Depot and asks for proper identification. They say fuck that shit and decide to blast the door down with the bomb that Baird makes in five minutes. Siri, you come across the flamethrower, like I mentioned earlier. It's not too powerful of a weapon, but it's fun for sure to use. They reminisce about Carmine, turn on a power, fight some wretches, Dom fucking dies, and back to Delta 2 with our proper identification. You gotta walk this heavy ass bomb to the door and defend against wretches with your pistol. This part isn't too difficult. Only thing that makes it hard is walking with the controls and playing with a bot if you don't have a second person with you. You get to the door, show them some proper identification, and now you have access to the rest of the place. The guy on the screen introduces himself as Niles, who is not a recording of someone, and says this place is the New Hope facility. Moving through the facility, there's security turrets and drones everywhere in the place, and Niles says it's to keep the facility clean. It looks pretty nasty in here to me, but okay. This place is the one part of the game that gave me some Gears 1 vibes. The first and second games are similar in gameplay, of course, but the atmosphere and tone between the two games are pretty different. The first had this dark and eerie atmosphere to it, and while this game is still dark in its own areas, it's, it feels a little bit more hopeful. You get past some more security, a long hallway of security turrets, which I'll never understand the use of. Like, do you really always need two people here to get through? And what for? But once past that, you come up to some stasis tanks with some weird looking bodies inside of them. And Niles says you're not supposed to be there, otherwise there could be consequences. Marcus asks Hoffman about the situation. He says anything they see from now on isn't in their databases, as in all of this and further is off record. So Hoffman has no idea what's going on down here and neither do you guys. They get to Jack and start finding info about the Locust Stronghold and then Marcus pulls his lever and the tanks start turning on and some glass starts cracking. A video shows up on the screen and Niles is talking, at least it's his voice but not exactly as you've heard it this far. He says they're doing their best to save the children and that they need to go to Mount Kadar, but Chairman Monroe won't authorize them to use vehicles to transport the subjects. Niles says he left a semi-sentient security system, clearly based on himself, to guard the facility and make sure no one disturbs the sires so that they could study them at the later date. The video cuts off and Niles tells them that they should probably leave now and they can hear some screaming coming from where those tanks are. So you know that whoever was here wanted to save these children and take these subjects to Mount Kadar but a previous chairman told them that they couldn't use vehicles so they must have had to walk there or some shit. Don't know who the children or subjects are and don't know why they were going to Mount Kadar or why the chairman told them at the time that they couldn't use vehicles but Niles tells you that you have awakened the sires and that could prove very problematic. You get back down to this area and one of these starts moving in his tank and well I'm sure you know what comes next. All of the sires start breaking out of their stasis tanks and start attacking you. Like I might have said earlier, I'm on insane difficulty in this playthrough, so these sires kill you in two fucking hits. I don't know why it couldn't have been three instead of two. This entire section is made easier as long as you have the Lancer, even though you still might screw up if they hit you first, because you have that delay where you can't pull out your Lancer again. But yeah, this is what I meant by the flamethrower. Like, why aren't they dying the first time? They just kept getting back up. Like, they're on fire. Why are they still here? I figured out the best way to do this is just to wait for them all to come to you at once, since there's a finite amount of them. When I first played, I thought it was an endless amount, and you had to open the gate while they were still attacking. I never thought to clear them first. I was somehow able to do that before, but this time Dom acts extra stupid, so I had to kill them first. While we're on the subject of Dom, you guys know that when you go up to chainsaw an enemy, you have invincibility for the duration of the chainsaw animation. But I never noticed if that body gets taken away that you're chainsawing, then your invincibility also goes away. So there's times throughout this where I would be chainsawing one of these sires and Dom would shoot the sire away. This would cause me to take some damage. Like I said, it's a two hit kill. So one hit from Dom getting rid of the sire I was killing and the second for the sire hitting me from behind. So thanks Dom. Now it says these sires are irreplaceable and a genetic bridge to the future and just starts rambling saying, did they know? what was awaiting them at Mount Kadar, did they deserve what they did to them, and should Niles, and I'm assuming other scientists much like him, be punished for it. Then as you guys shut down his system, he asks, will the people listen to the truth once they've fully been cleansed? Don't know what or who he's talking about for now. Like I said, there's some collectibles that can give you some background about where you might be at at the time. So there's a few that you can find around this facility. There's one where Niles sends a memo to everybody working at the facility saying not to talk to any public media about an internal information leak that they had. Another one about Niles lying about the subjects and and one of the subjects ends up killing another one in front of another doctor. And after that doctor saw that, they're now thinking that it's time to go. There's a medical file with a 15 year old girl with some similar characteristics to Ty post torture and someone else we'll see in the next chapter. That same doctor from before also discovered that sires were out of control. And there's also these markings here on the wall counting days, weeks, or months. 
There's a lot of them regardless, so they must have been here for a long time. So yes, Niles is using children secretly with these people in this facility for experiments, and they are the sires. As for Mount Kadar, we still don't know yet. Now it's time to go, and now there's Razor Hail. Locusts start attacking the facility at this point, and now we have Flame Grenadiers, a new enemy type that obviously has a flamethrower and a gas canister on their back. If you shoot it enough, it catches fire and eventually blows up, making killing them pretty trivial since they're really tanky on the higher difficulties. There's even a boomer variant of the Flame Grenadier that pops up later. Fight through these Locusts and use some security systems to your advantage and eventually make it to a room with open glass and a razor hail just starts picking up now that you've got outside and you got the locust to deal with on top of that. This section of the game was always really fun to me. The hail was a really cool element here and now you have to get around it. Use a couple train cars and these what must be camps or places that they held the kids where we found those markings which it's funny how the razor hail cuts through these gears armor better than the thin sheets of metal protecting them above them but okay. Back to the courtyard from where you first arrived and another enemy type enters. It's another boomer type called maulers. They have a shield that expands in a heavy explosive mace. Shown initially covering themselves from the hail, they normally will attempt to block your shots, but are extremely exposed at their feet and their huge back. You can also use a shield after taking them out for the same uses as well, and even put it down for cover. You make it to the centaur, fend off some reavers while they attack you while Baird's repairing a car, and they take off. And now for the best and most exciting part of this game. Now their objective is to get to Mount Kadar, search for the Locust Stronghold, and then deploy a beacon once they've found it so that they can send more of the pods down there that they sent earlier into the hollow. And they need to drive up there. Sorry, correction. You need to drive up there. Yes, once again, Gears has a driving portion, except this one is more heinous than the last one. Before, all you had to worry about was the krill, and now you've got reavers, all these locust camps, two ice lakes with mortars attacking you, a full squadron of locusts at this fucking tower, and corpses and brumox. I don't remember this section being so long, hard, and annoying. Pause. The driving controls when you use the look or aim as a direction that you drive in rather than just driving with one stick and aiming with the other is pretty ass. You're gonna die really fast on hardcore and insane. You don't wanna sit still and shoot, otherwise you're just gonna eat a bunch of damage. I think they made the controls the way they were, maybe for this part alone of the driving, cause when a mortar comes to hit you, it'll just hit the ice in front of you. But you won't know where to go until you move too far. When it does happen, you can end up just like this, driving too much, even an inch, and you're fucking drowning and it's back to the top. What I mean by the driving control is that you can spin the vehicle in any direction without needing to move forward. This is helpful assuming your momentum doesn't take you in the water first. It really just forces you to kind of drive extremely slow waiting for the path to be made for you and then proceed which just feels really boring. But once you eventually get past the lakes, cause remember there's fucking two of them, just one longer than the other. You fight through some reavers, then need to shoot some cedars off a ridge. Otherwise the nemesis will hit you. I didn't know this part was even coming up and this happened to me. The nemesis had already been on the way to hit me before I even got to where they were visible for me and I died in one hit. So I didn't even know what happened until I came back around a second time and was more careful to look ahead. I don't think I had this issue when I played when I was younger, but this shouldn't happen regardless. And I don't know if this happened to anybody else, but how can you get shot by something so very far off screen before being alerted that they're there in the first place. Kind of an annoying and a needed death, but not game breaking of course, just frustrating on top of what's coming next. Eventually you're at this huge area with a lot of enemies, few boomers, and a tower with many troikas and a barricade. Once you pass a certain point, the turrets will begin to shoot at you. Now at least on insane, this part is just straight shit. As soon as you drive forward, you'll die in less than about three to five seconds to those turrets. You gotta take that tower down and then the troikas will stop. The only way I made it past this when I was younger and even now is just to drive forward and then and drive back up to where you came from and take cover and try to peek and shoot the tower down. Even if you take cover, you can still be shot and killed. Even if you kill all the enemies in the area, it'll be the turrets that kill you. Once you garner the skill to dodge with shitty driving controls, you then enter the mountain and it's dark as shit in here. And you eventually fall far down and a centaur turns off, including the lights. While Baird's repairing, three corpses pull up and try to attack you. You shoot them in succession as they open up, which is pretty stupid that they don't attack you all at once, but I guess the locusts are pretty dumb. You then face off against three Brumox, Baird pisses himself driving over the bridge, and now your time is driving is over. You come up to Stu, the guy with the gas station in the first game. He says he's been near with other stranded after Delta blew his gas station up. Apparently they've been here for a few months avoiding roads and something called Nexus, a place where the locusts keep coming from. The stranded are on the move again since the locusts have started attacking areas that they didn't before and are kidnapping slash torturing people as we've learned. Stu tells them that Nexus is just beyond the lake, making that their next destination. Marcus makes Delta 2 take the stranded to the surface and to come back in the grind list once they set the beacon off. Dom asks if Stu's ever seen Maria and he says she's familiar, but she was with a group that got captured, so things are not looking very good. Delta 1 continues in search of Nexus and needs a boat to cross the waters ahead. The locusts down here have gunboats. They're pretty cool, but this is literally the only time and place you're ever gonna see these, so why do the locusts even have them in the first place? Maybe they expected the gears to show up down here at some point, but you clear out the area, move up to 
to the boat you and Dom were thinking of taking earlier at the end of the pier and is submerged in water, so they need a new plan. Luckily, the locusts give them some help and break off the pier that they were standing on so perfectly that they could still keep drifting. Okay, so after seeing these locusts going around with gunboats and how much water it looks like they would have to traverse, why would they think of using this small ass boat, especially one with no fucking cover? And it's also a rowboat, so where's y'all's oars? I thought at least one of these two were smart. They start getting attacked by some of the gunboats, but once you make it to some emulsion fumes, they start to back off. A couple minutes later, a giant fish swims underneath. Another gunboat comes up and they hijack it. Then you've got to defend against some number of boats for a while until you get to a cave and then they back off of you again. You then see a giant ripple on water next to you and then you come up to a waterfall. They recover somehow from this height with nothing to grab onto, yet they're fine. I ignore this every time I play this game, which has been a lot, but Jesus, really? They fell from this height and they were still on the boat just fine. They didn't get separated from the boat. They didn't drown. They didn't die from the impact of falling this fucking far. I wish the stupidity would just stop there, but we've got one more thing coming up. They start seeing and hearing something big move underwater and eventually these two fish slaves get massacred and explode. Huge ass tentacles start coming out of the water and you need to chainsaw them before they take down the boat. Once again, I'm on insane and I did not realize you have literally three seconds to start chainsawing it or you're gonna die. It's so damn fast, I don't know why I had trouble with it in the first place. I did encounter a glitch, something that's happened kind of often in this game that I haven't really mentioned yet, but I get stuck in random places, not being able to move at all until I either dodge or just move my controller around a lot. And it happened here and I died because I ran out of time, so that was great. But after getting the tentacles off of you, it backs off, swims towards you, hits your boat, then swims around again to the front of the boat. Okay, before I talk about this fight, how did it get here? It was also up top with us before the waterfall, so how did it get down here to attack us? Did it swim around somewhere and make it to us in time to attack us, or is there a second one? I mean, we see another one in the third game, and I think these guys that were driving the boat for us are mini leviathans, at least that's what I'm going to believe. So maybe there was just a second one down here to attack us. That's what makes the most sense, so I'm just going to roll with that. So the leviathan holds on to the boat with only its teeth, and you need to shoot its eyes to get it off, otherwise it'll bring the boat down. Once it's shot, the mouth will open, and Marcus's plan is to kill it from the inside, just like the worm. Once you get inside the mouth, it has these six tendrils that wind up and attack you. You need to shoot these a couple times, and its spiked throat thing opens up, and you got a lob nade inside of it. Repeat this a couple times, and that's really it. Alrighty, we finally made it down here. You know, for some savages, they got some nice architectural designs down here. They see Nexus, and Marcus is ready to plant the beacon, but Dom is still concerned with fighting Maria. Dom insists, using Marcus's dad against him, and they leave together to try and find her. Okay, so there's this section here where if the locusts turn the water back on, you die. I assume from falling when the water drops, you know, but it's not a death from up here. I know they're not the exact same situations, but I'm still a little hung up on that. Making their way down to the camps, they then come up to these terminals with symbols on them and have a log of all the prisoners that they've taken in. They figure out that these symbols signify each area, so Jack finds Maria in the system and her corresponding symbol. After checking a few of these, you finally find a terminal with the same symbol as before, so Jack begins searching for Maria while you defend since you've been caught. After defending, what feels like a shit ton of locusts, Jack finds her and, and damn dude, this scene just hurts. He hadn't seen her in who knows how long and when he finally gets there, she's like this. I think he was still dreaming looking at her not realizing how she really looked like. It really sucks that she had to die too after all this time, but after seeing Ty, you could see this coming. Doesn't mean it doesn't hit hard though. Seeing Dom break down like this, the music and the gunshot followed by silence. And man, when I was younger, I was like, oh, okay, well she still looks like that, but they can just take her with her on some dumb escort mission and they can, I don't know, try to keep her alive for as long as they can. But then he whips this out and I was just like, whoa. Also really got to give props to whoever Dom's voice actor is, Carlos Ferro. I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah, his acting got a lot better from the first game to this one. Marcus then gives Dom two options to either sneak in or go in guns blazing. And of course, you know what his choice is. I mentioned earlier and I'm gonna say it again, the structural design of this area is so amazing. There's so much detail for a game that came out in 2008. The doors, the walls, these weird yellow switches randomly placed around here for cover. Yeah, the design of this entire section of the game is probably the second best area in the entire trilogy for me. So it's time to find some solid ground so you can deploy that beacon. So you fight and fight and fight. It's just some long fighting segments for a while, but I actually like fighting through these areas, mainly because using these switches for cover and combat and being able to disable their own cover, but also have yours disabled is really engaging. And it's just a lot of fun down here. The queen is also talking over some intercom, saying things like, we will win this fight or your queen's beside you. And keep in mind, she's talking about fighting, of course, but she doesn't seem to be talking about the cog. There's a fighting section if you get to these doors before they close all the way down 
around before the combat segment begins, you can get to some Troika turrets and they help in the fight. I never caught it before and just thought you could never make it there to begin with. But you gotta start running once you see these doors start closing. The area this segment takes place at is I think a place where they process and chop up rock worms for food. Pretty wild, but I do wonder how they eat them. Like, do they barbecue, grill them, or do they just eat that shit raw? They don't look like they'd be worried about seasoning their food. So I don't know. This is also, I think, the last new enemy type, which is just the butcher. These guys are like the grinders, maulers, boomers, but it just has a big cleaver to slash you with. So they're pretty easy to deal with. I'm assuming their job is just to chop up the rock worms, so you're not gonna see them very often anyway. You finally get down to a spot where you can set off the beacon for those grind lifts, and they begin coming down soon after. So I know they were waiting on standby for the beacon, but how close were they to the location where we set off the beacon? Like at the beginning of the game, it took a little while to set up everything for them to actually begin their descent. But here they just start coming down just a couple minutes after we set that beacon off. So were they just close by all of a sudden? Eventually you meet up with Baird and Cole since they touched down not too far from where you were. Load up on this gondola and you fight. Cross to another one, then you defend against some reavers. Once on the other side, the queen starts talking about the Lambent, saying they're inferior and you see a fight going on in front of you, but they aren't fighting any cog soldiers. A little later, you can see two factions fighting, except one group is glowing. It's at this point, if you remember the wretches from the first game and haven't paying attention to what the queen is saying, we find out that these are the lambent that the queen is talking about. And presumably they're lambent from all the emulsion in the aftermath of the light mass bomb in the first game. The only question is why are they attacking as a separate faction since the wretches didn't attack the locusts before? Into a room later where you find a body of one of these lambent locusts and Delta comes to the conclusion that the real reason that they've been acting so desperate is because they're losing another war down here. They've been trying to escape the emulsion and the lambent down here, but also screw the humans over in the process. You eventually make it to an elevator that takes them down to the palace, and honestly, I can't really explain this shit, so I'll just show it. I guess it goes to show that they're connected. I don't really know what the scene was for. Once down there, you've got a mildly difficult ambush to get through. Honestly, they really should have been stopped here, because they are surrounded. But whatever, after that, they head left and down another elevator, and then come across some blood mounts that the locusts seem to be imprisoning here, I guess waiting to be let out to just die in combat, which is pretty sad, honestly, if that's all their life is. There is a lot of fighting ahead, so we're just gonna kind of skip over. Wait. Oh, I was looking for this. Hmm. Who wants toast? I like them crispy. I like them crispy on the outside. Hell yeah. Yeah, I don't know why the Easter egg's here in the first place, but if you shoot this pillar, that will happen. And I think this only happens on Hardcore and Insane. Correct me if I'm wrong, but either way, it's funny and I love it. Also, Cole again says, Damn, that's a lot of juice. Oh man, don't start with that juice shit again. Look at all that juice. So you get down to a command center and you see that their plan is to sink Jacinto and the Hollow, which is their home, just to get rid of the Lambent threat. Destroying their home to ensure their victory over a threat. Hmm. That sounds vaguely familiar, and I'm sure their plan will be just as effective. The queen keeps talking and she- Let my boys in your house, bitch! You hear that shit? You grim ass bitches are going down! Like way down! Dead down! So now you ain't gonna know what twins up! Your ass is gonna be crying to your skink ass queen! Oh mommy, you let the bad man hurt us! Fuck you! We gonna whoop your mama's ass! Whoa! There we go, one muzzled queen. Not you, her. Yeah, he sure fucking told her. I love this dude, man. Jack finds a log in a computer and someone is talking about how they would be able to end the war if they just sunk Jacinto, but it sounds older and Marcus and Dom recognize the voice as Adam Phoenix. He's in their system on an audio log or some shit, but we don't know why. We just know what the next objective is going to be. There's this long hallway split section, which is actually pretty fun to be able to shoot to the other side and fight on your own side. Once you're done up top, you go down and fight through this really long hallway all the way to the queen's door. Ah, another ambush. Oh wait, it's okay, we can just go back up again. Was this built in the palace as a trap or did it have other uses? Like, did they use this to bring the queen food quickly or some shit? Because it's a big ass palace. And last time I'm gonna speak about it, but whoever the locust architect is needs a fucking raise because look at this place. Maybe they'll get more rock worms to eat or something. And okay, you know I gotta ask. What the hell is the point of all these switches around the palace and all these pieces of cover? What's it all for? Were they preparing for us to be down here? Like, are there any uses for any of this shit when they're not fighting down here? Like, what's the what was the purpose of all these things being built? 
built down here? Or are they just always training? Like, are these training grounds down here that we're walking through? I don't know, but these games have me thinking a little too much. So we finally meet her. And okay, sorry, one more thing. Why is the queen still here? Like, she heard all of that fighting outside her door just now, right? Like, she had to have heard all of that shooting that we just went through. It's been like an hour. She heard all of that, right? She heard Cole. Like, she knows we're coming. And it's just her and Scourge. I don't know why she's sitting here like fucking Cersei waiting for everybody else to show up. Like, did she know she was going to be able to get out of this situation? Like, did she know that they weren't just going to shoot at her immediately? Like, Scourge can't block bullets. So I'm trying to figure out what her plan was here. I digress. For now. Why does she look kind of fine? I'm playing. Or am I? And also, why does she look like a human? Hope you're not looking for an answer anytime soon. Anyway, she knows if you're a Jacinto plan and knows Marcus is Adam's son somehow, but flees and leaves Scourge for us. Delta 2 goes off to stop the queen. Why they didn't just shoot her in the leg or some shit on the spot is beyond me. But this boss fight with Scourge is fun as hell. Dodging multiple inks that he throws at you, having to dodge these tickers, which was kind of the annoying part of the fight, and then these stalactites and giant pillars that he cuts down. They also made having a chainsaw battle in this game epic as hell. Although you only need to do it three times with him and then he dips. The music in this fight is also cool as shit too. I also think it's funny that anytime Scourge comes to use his chainsaw, he just ignores the shit out of Dom. Even Dom back there is like, you I'm like, you're not gonna help? You get out there and surprise, surprise, Delta 2 was not able to catch up to a woman walking away two miles an hour in this heavy ass whatever the hell she's got on. And okay, I know I keep going off script, but there's so much shit that I have to talk about. Like I said, they weren't able to catch up with her and she was right here. So like, did they not run at all? Did she get on a reaver immediately when she got outside? And if that is the case, why didn't they come back in the throne room to help with the fight? Did they just stay outside and wait? They heard pillars falling, ink grenades going off, tickers exploding, chainsaws revving, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna sit that shit out. They catch some reavers up ahead and somehow the reavers just let them start controlling them. There's a lot to be said about that. Like are the reavers trained or do they just blindly follow whatever you tell them to do. Are the locusts trained to ride reavers? And if so, how does Delta figure this out so fast? Look, I love this long part of reaver riding, but you know I have to question everything. Do the reavers know that the cog are having them shoot at other locusts? Like, do they care? The locusts probably didn't treat these reavers very well to begin with, but still. And once again, someone, this time Dom, questions Marcus's logic about taking these reavers, and Marcus is just like, hey, go ahead and shut the fuck up for me, all right? You fly through some locusts, help some cog out, and then Scourge reappears with his giant reaver and they start attacking you. You don't really fly the reaver, you just kind of control whether they lean left or right. So really just steering and shooting. The machine gun is in the back and the rockets are in the front and you'll switch depending on whichever direction you're facing. The giant reaver chases you through a tunnel, you fend it off for a while and eventually get away from it and make it outside and then start fighting a shitload of reavers on the way back to Chacinto through these trees. You make it to an open break and Scourge returns and you gotta shoot his tentacles off that's grabbing you and then you gotta shoot a rocket in its mouth when it flies towards you. You do this a couple times and Scourge will fall along with Hydra. You make it to Jacinta almost getting killed by one of those Reavers but they leave you alone anyway and then you make it to command and the cog is currently evacuating the hollow along with Jacinto. You meet Prescott here as well and he admits Adam has been right about things the entire time. Something these two should probably get some time to discuss. Ah, the locusts are attacking, Never mind. maybe another time. Prescott if you could just stay right there please don't leave us we'll be right back i love that marcus says control we're gonna need air support here asap sorry colonel nothing's available right now hey colonel i guess we are the support huh looks that way sergeant let's get to it and hoffman doesn't even get it are you kidding you are the support, son! Shoot some reavers, get communication back, defend against some Brumox, and then you get back to command. They have the plan to use another light mass bomb to be deployed underground to sink Jacinto, but they're currently blocked off by Nemesis, so Delta-1 gets tasked to go clear that area to bring the bomb. So now it's really just guns blazing from here on out. But you fight through this house, and then you'll need to fight through this awful fucking courtyard of enemies. It looks pretty out here, but this part just has so many enemies and three waves at that. You got your regular variety of enemies here, Cantus, whatever. Then you have some Maulers show up with some some wretches I believe and then you have blood mounts everyone's favorites all right we're gonna get through these next parts quick you get through these streets you encounter this guy have this happen to you because Dom fucking sucks find a hammer of Don again use it for a little bit use this crane to get across these falling buildings get burnt to death a couple of times who wants toast fall down some levels cut this thing to use to cross buildings fall out of it and survive fight some more fall again use an elevator to move sideways as a result of the fall don't know how that works and finally we're here a broomock starts firing at you and you run around and kill the pilot and now now Marcus gets the very bright idea to ride this broom rock down to clear the area much faster. And honestly, it would have taken him days to fight through all these locusts if this broom rock hadn't have been here in the first place. So I guess hooray for another coincidence. Now piloting the broom rock, you have a melee, rockets, and a minigun. And you can yell at people too, I guess, so that's cool. You start clearing these locusts out, and Jesus, these guys were not prepared for some crazy-ass cog soldier to take one of their own broom rocks. We get a short death battle here between the broom rock and a corpser, and a corpser gets fucking rocked. And a question actually occurred to me. If we're able to pilot and control 
control these Brumox and Reavers. What about the corpses? Do they just assist in battle out of their own volition, or are they slaves too? The next game shows that it's probably the latter, but they still don't require pilots like the others do. Make it further, and you're at the final objective. You gotta destroy these pillars to open the sky for the ravens to get through while also fending off these nemesis. This entire section, I think you can die since you can take damage, but it never really happened to me while I was down here, and it doesn't really feel difficult at all down here. But it's extremely fun, so who cares? The Brumach just starts losing it as the ravens start coming down, and the Brumach hits the raven with the light mass bomb on it, but not the one with Delta 2 on it. They lose the bomb, but the Brumach is mutating like a lambent, and they decide that that's the new bomb. How it mutated so fast, I'm not really sure. Maybe because it spent the last 20 minutes sitting in emulsion, but we've never seen a mutation happen from start to finish, at least that I can remember for sure. So I'm just going to assume that that's the reason. But yeah, it turns into this monstrosity, and you got to laser it down for like 25 seconds, and then it starts exploding, and that's the end of the game. I've seen people complain about this, feeling like a fake boss, or it just being a spectacle, and while that's true that it is a spectacle, I don't think it needed to be a boss fight, just like how Rom was at the end of the first game. We already fought Scourge, twice really, and we stormed through all of the Locust Palace and Jacinto. I think this was just fine the way they did it. This couple with the last cutscene is also really cool, and it gives me chills every time I watch it. The music, the sheer destruction of the entire city, the Locust getting flooded, Dom looking at the photo of Maria, Marcus frantically calling to see if Anya is really safe, all the ravens with evacuees with an unclear destination, it's such a satisfying conclusion that it still leaves you asking for more because you know it's not over since you hear the queen talking over all of this. I like how they play with Anya's fate and make it seem like she might have died while the queen is saying things like life goes on and that life is cruel while Dom is looking at the picture of Maria then telling Marcus that it's okay he lost Anya, like when Marcus was there for him with Maria, only for Anya to still be alive. You don't see much emotion out of Marcus, but here you get to see it and it's really touching. This game is all good things a good sequel should strive to be. It should, at the very least, expand and improve on its initial core product and add some new things to keep it fresh and not feel like the same game. I know for sure that I'm playing Gears of War 2 and not Gears of War 1 here. Better and more interesting dialogue, sound quality of all things, not just gunshots but explosions, the weapons are different this time, there's newer weapons and executions, and a load of new experiences within the story mode like riding a broomot or gutting and evolved Alaskan bullworm from the inside. While most of those things are just improvements, they all made this game feel like a proper sequel. And this isn't even including the story. I of course had my questions along the way, but the story as a whole is a pretty good one, and it's still fun to play through to this day. The first game was really fine enough to map the tunnels, blow them up, and that was it. So the next game is let's attack their home, stop the cities from sinking, then attack the real home or the queen, then stop them with another bomb. I mean, I guess there's still a bomb, but you get my point. There was more that happened in this game. I mean, an entire city was sunk in front of your entire eyes by a giant rock worm. I'm sorry, that just still sounds insane. The story was really fun, exciting, depressing for a little bit, but still overall amazing. The story and flow was amazing. The characters were amazing for what we got. The music in this game is just great. From the menu music, the main theme and Prescott speech, the end of the game too. I could go on and on, but the music in this game is just some of the best. Thank you so much for those that actually made it this far in a video, and please subscribe if you choose. I make these videos myself, and I kind of just work on these videos whenever I can get to them, so I might end up actually hiring a video editor, because I'm certainly doing a video for Gears of War 3 at the very least, and you guys probably don't want to wait another six months for the next video. Once again, thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll get a video out in less than six months this time, but until then, peace out.